Machiavelli, genius, political theorist, tragically misunderstood pragmatist, dude bro of Cesare Borgia. He was an Italian Renaissance political philosopher, a statesman, and the secretary of the Florentine Republic. Machiavelli came to his little position of power with the fall of the Medicis and with the rise of Cesare Borgia, but was dismissed when his father, who was a pope, died and the Medicis rose again. Machiavelli was then arrested and tortured for conspiracy, after which he retired from Florence and that is when he wrote his books. When the Medicis were finally kicked out again, good old Machiavelli went wandering back to Florence expecting to get his old job back, but he was denied and after a month in Florence he died from illness. Poor guy. Though he was a great writer, it seemed he was not a great doer and was rather impressionable. The translator writes in the introduction to The Prince that he was misled by Caterina Sforza, ignored by Louis XII, overawed by Cesare Borgia. Several of his embassies were quite barren of results. Machiavelli's attempts to fortify Florence failed and the soldiery that he raised astonished everybody by their cowardice. Ugh, poor guy. Not to say he wasn't successful, he was, but the actions of great men cannot be found in his life, only in his writings. So, the prince, was it any good? And did he and Cesare Borgia ever kiss? You tell me. Therefore, he who considers it necessary to secure himself in his new principality, to win friends, to overcome either by force or fraud, to make himself beloved and feared by the people, to be followed and revered by the soldiers, to exterminate those who have power or reason to hurt him, to change the older order of things for new, to be severe and gracious, magnanimous and liberal, to destroy a disloyal soldiery and to create new, to maintain friendships with kings and princes in such a way that they must help him with zeal and offend with caution cannot find a more lively example than the actions of Cesare Borgia. Hey, I love talking on the phone. But hey. I'm James, and if you're new here, what we do here is a little something called Sackbow, where we summarize, analyze, criticize, beauty, originality, and wisdom as found in books. And this is book negative one out of 200. We're doing a pre-canon warm-up. All right, in one sentence, what is this book about? It is about how a prince may get a principality, may run a principality, and may keep a principality. A principality is a state run by a prince. Now, the construction of this book is so clear and sequential that it's just beautiful. The first half of the book is concerning what kind of principalities there are and through each chapter he'll go through a type. For example, firstly we have hereditary principalities, then mixed principalities, then principalities which are acquired by one's own arms and ability, all the way down to ecclesiastical principalities. Then from there he goes into how many kinds of soldiery there are, then why mercenaries are completely useless, auxiliaries a little less useless than that, and the only trustworthy form of military is one's own. Then through the second half of the book, it is how a prince should conduct himself to run and keep a principality. Now, reading this book for me, especially after reading The Myth of Sisyphus, was such a relief, a good relief. Machiavelli has written with depth, his prose is completely concrete, 100% from beginning to end, actually, which is kind of astonishing. And on top of this, he has in his back pocket, it seems, all these powerful examples from ancient history and uh, nearer history of great men. And he cites these examples precisely when the petulant reader is getting skeptical. He'll say, you should act like this. And then he'll pull out of his back pocket four examples and serve it to you on a platter and say, here's why you should do it according to the greatest men of history that history has recorded. There was also this funny recurring theme I found. A recurring, but it wasn't so often as I'm making it sound. But there I'd be reading innocently. And he would say, now it's best for a prince to follow the example of uh, Cesare Borgia or a great man because 
when uh, Cesare Borgia brought these uh, leading dukes to dinner one night and after long festivities and much drinking and all around happiness, he killed them all. And I'm like, whoa, what the hell? And every time it would seem to come out of nowhere. And I think, you know, at least four times throughout the book, he would say that in the end, no one rose up in revenge against this great man because he had exterminated all of their family. And you'd use his precise words. Cesare Borgia exterminated their family or it would do you well to exterminate their family or their family was exterminated. And now there was one little teeny weeny part at the end that also slapped me in the face out of nowhere. But amid all the talk of murder, betrayal, killing, and bloodshed, this might strike readers a little more sharply. And ugh, Machiavelli was doing so well as well. Oh man. Anyway, he's talking about fortune here. He goes, for my part, I consider that it is better to be adventurous than cautious because fortune is a woman. And if you wish to keep her under, it is necessary to beat and ill use her. Oh shit, man. Today, we're reviewing Vampire Academy. Now, I really love this book, but I when I read that, I felt like I was holding a hand grenade all of a sudden. If I had to rate how jealous I was of Machiavelli's writings, I'd say a two, because it feels sufficiently far away enough from myself in my writing, but his skill at the incision is to be strived for. Now, style and gusto. Machiavelli is, and of course it's through the translator, I'm at the translator's mercy, but Machiavelli is um, extremely economical with his words and therefore extremely precise. I mean, there isn't an unneeded word anywhere. And also the sentences reflect this. There's not one unneeded or it would seem semi superfluous sentence anywhere. And this at times leads Machiavelli to use skillfully many semicolons one after the other to not let the idea of a sentence fall unworthy of the rest of his writings. And thus the prince has way, way, way more clarity than any book has the right to have. You cannot be confused with this book. There's hardly a page in here that you have to reread out of confusion caused by the intertwining of sentences and ideas where they should be separate. Well, unlike in other books where ideas are thrown here and there, and here's an idea, here's an idea, and this is an idea I just said, here's another idea. Go take them and chew on them as you please. Machiavelli, on the other hand, you know, has crafted all of his ideas and made them as simple and understandable and bite-sizable, like a morsel, as possible and as nutritious as possible. So there is no fat anywhere in The Prince, unlike The Mist of Sisyphus, where there's a lot of fat. And with this clarity, he has wiped away like mud all the emotions to gain a clearer picture of the image of the reality of the processes, his so-called objective view of things. And this is why I think he seems so dastardly, cruel, uh, despicable, and immoral to literary history. Now, don't get me wrong, he is those things just to a littler, smaller degree. But surprisingly, when I went into it, I found that it wasn't all drenched in cruelty and mayhem, and it wasn't all betrayal. Some betrayal, but it wasn't all. You know, at least half of it is, well, all the knowledge is still applicable, but half of it, at least, is hyper applicable to anyone uh, who finds himself in a leadership position from, you know, to the very bottom of the employment hierarchy to, you know, hospitality and to the very top of society in uh, politics again. But even if you're, say, a senior employee at a cafe or a supervisor at a supermarket, this book actually has heaps of useful advice for someone who wants to gain an unemotional view of things and see how the social dynamics of power 
you might say, and I don't want to sound Foucauldian, but, but to anyone situated in a hierarchy of any sort, this book seems to wipe all of the feelings away from it and look at the cogs and gears of the system and how they can be manipulated and moved and you know the effects of occupying somewhere high and not taking proper care to lay the foundations or acting like someone below your station or what effect being slothful at some certain high station will have on the station one holds and if we are to talk about characters in a non-fiction book you couldn't ask for a better a better text because Machiavelli in bringing in all these examples from ancient history to his uh, era paints all these small vignettes of these colorful rulers and some of the best I think are his small paintings of the Roman emperors let me just read a few I think this is how you pronounce it Antoninus was a most eminent man and had very excellent qualities which made him admirable in the sight of the people and acceptable to the soldiers for he was a warlike man most enduring of fatigue a despiser of all delicate food and other luxuries which caused him to be beloved by the armies nevertheless his ferocity and cruelties were so great and so unheard of that after endless single murders he killed a large number of the people of Rome and all of those of Alexandria. He became hated by the whole world and also feared by those he had around him to such an extent that he was murdered in the midst of his army by a centurion. All right, we have a whopping four moments of beauty this time. Now I won't go so in depth on each one, but I just couldn't take any of them out because I wanted to show them to other people. Now Machiavelli's metaphors have a complete and simple utility about them. And here's the first excerpt. This is on page 41. A wise man ought always to follow the path beaten by great men and to imitate those who have been supreme so that if his ability does not equal theirs, at least it will savor of it. Let him act like the clever archers who, designing to hit the mark which just appears too far distant and knowing the limits to which the strength of their bow attains, take aim much higher than the mark not to reach by their strength or arrow to so great a height, but to be able to, with the aid of so high an aim to hit the mark they wish to reach. Now I think archery metaphors are so, it seems to me, well embedded inside the English language itself. The examples aren't coming to me, but we have, say, the blank of one's eye. Blank being the obsolete term, I think, for the center, the center archery target. What's it called? The bullseye. And maybe even also the apple of one's eye. Then there are the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. And also hamasha, which is a Greek word that Aristotle used to mean tragic flaw in the poetics. And he took it from the verb form of hamasha, which is to miss the mark. And Machiavelli here adds onto that nice list with a new and beautiful uh, example of his own. But in conclusion, whatever your target be, sometimes it seems merely aiming at the target is not enough. And sometimes your body feels that and that's when the anxiety bubbles up and overtakes all of your future plans. But to aim at the imitation of a great man or woman to with the intention of hitting your mark, that seems to me a metaphor that just widens consciousness that breathes a new life into it. Now the next I've termed beauty of light as you'll see here it is and this is on page 43 and it ought to be remembered that there is nothing more difficult to take in hand more perilous to conduct or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things because the innovator has for enemies all those who have done well under the old conditions and lukewarm defenders in those who may do well under the new. This coolness arises partly from fear of the opponents who have the laws on their side and partly from the incredulity of men who do not readily believe in new things until they have had a long experience of them. Thus, it happens that whenever those who are hostile have the opportunity to attack, they do it like partisans, whilst the others defend lukewarmly in such wise that the prince is endangered along with them. Now, the illumination, the light thrown out by this section seems to me 
so piercing and effulgent that it applies to anyone who's trying to take, who's trying to create or apply a new order of things to anything of old, whether that be, say, a new way of performing art, a new way of writing, a new way of painting, a new uh, genre of music, or at work, trying to create or apply a new system of things because you see a way to make everything more efficient and you see a way to uh, decrease in uh, employee redundancy of action. And as happens most of the time, when one tries to apply th this new order of things onto the world in front of them, everyone seems to resist and the few people who stand by you, stand by you lukewarmly at most because they can't, it seems to you, they can't see what you see, but also they have other people to fear. They have their reputation on the line. And if you fail, then they fail. For what reason? They have no ego in the game. And this is precisely why people don't try to make new orders of things or try to apply them or try to you know, restructure organizations willy-nilly when it seems to new people who come along and look at it and take one look at, say, some organization that it could be made so much more effective if they just did this and this and, and this. And it seems like everyone's blind to all the negativities of the organization or structure they inhabit. But in reality, they are not blind, they are just cowards. And this is why it's so hard to find honest people. Everybody lies and only some people are willing to do the work. And also we can insert here any trite sayings about change. Everybody hates change and this is one of the reasons. But this also reminds me of the Emerson line in one of his essays where he says, there is no history, only biography. However, I do feel obliged to bring up the conservative counter argument in that it is much easier to make things worse and much harder to make things better, as shown by the several communistic attempts at realizing their own utopias by restructuring society and collectivizing, well, most importantly, food production. And as we know now, Stalin's attempts at utopia brought about for his own people 9 to 12 million deaths from famine and executions, I believe. And Chairman Mao Zedong, his Great Leap Forward policy, in which he collectivized all the farms, brought about 45 million deaths from famine, which is an unfathomable, unfathomable number. It's literally unthinkable. Okay, now, cognitive strength. Let's go on with this. The first example comes on page two on the dedication, because here, as he uh, wrote the book and sent it to a prince, it seemed to me so cunning and crafty and original, cognitively powerful to be able to say to a prince, look, I've made you, I've written you a manual on how to do your job and me being only uh, of the people and not of royal blood, I know what to do better than you. Now, of course, this is playing with fire. This is coaxing the lion from its den, so to say. I mean, this was the age when they would execute you hither and thither. So in the dedication, Machiavelli better have some good reasons to defend himself for telling a prince how to do his job. And so we get this paragraph. Nor do I hold with those who regard it as a presumption if a man of low and humble condition dare to discuss and settle the concerns of princes. Because just as those who draw landscapes place themselves below in the plain to contemplate the nature of the mountains and of lofty places, and in order to contemplate the plains, place themselves high upon the mountains, even so, to understand the nature of the people, it needs to be a prince. And to understand that of princes, it needs to be of the people. <sighs> Bullet dodged. I mean, right here, this is Machiavelli's literary equivalent of doing the matrix dodge. <laughs> Bullet time. <laughs> and just dodging all of the landmines that could have got him killed. All right, here's a second in originality. And this is page 130. And he's talking about whether it is better to be feared or loved. Upon this a question arises, 
whether it be better to be loved than feared or feared than loved. It may be answered that one should wish to be birthed, but because it is difficult to unite them in one person, it is much safer to be feared than loved when of the two, either must be dispensed with. Because this is to be asserted in general of men that they are ungrateful, fickle, false, cowardly, covetous, and as long as you succeed, they are yours entirely, they will offer you their blood, property, life, and children, as I said above, when the need is far distant, but when it approaches, they turn against you. And a little onwards, and men have less scruple in offending one who is beloved than one who is feared, for love is preserved by the link of obligation, which, owing to the baseness of men, is broken at every opportunity for their advantage, but fear preserves you by a dread of punishment which never fails. And a little onwards again. But when it is necessary for him to proceed against the life of someone, he must do it on proper justification and for manifest cause. But above all things, he must keep his hands off the property of others because men more quickly forget the death of their father than the loss of their patrimony. Okay, this is a dark view of man, but it seems quite right. We're getting a big old whiff of Hobbes. And this is probably why Machiavelli has uh, been described as an out and out cynic. I mean, with things like, it is better, it is much safer to be feared than loved. I mean, this is true, but, and his description of man as ungrateful, fickle, false, etc. And men have less scruple in offending those who they love. And then the coup de grace, a prince must keep his hands off the property of men, because they more quickly forget the death of their father than the loss of their patrimony. Machiavelli's being cheeky here. But I mean, here he has taken the cadaver of man and just taken his scalpel and just and opened it and now the third of originality. This is on page 137 on the chapter concerning the way in which princes should keep faith. faith. And it is about faith with one's promises with other people and countries and states and princes. You must know there are two ways of contesting or striving for mastery. The one by the law, the other by force. The first method is proper to men, the second to beasts. But because the first is frequently not sufficient, it is necessary to have recourse to the second. Therefore, it is necessary for a prince to understand how to avail himself of the beast and the man. And onwards, a prince therefore being compelled knowingly to adopt the beast ought to choose the fox and the lion because the lion cannot defend himself against snares and the fox cannot defend himself against wolves. Therefore it is necessary to be a fox to discover the snares and a lion to terrify the wolves. Those who rely simply on the lion do not understand what they are about. Therefore a wise lord cannot, nor ought he to, keep faith when such observance may be turned against him and when the reasons that caused him to pledge it exist no longer. If men were entirely good, this precept would not hold, but because they are bad and will not keep faith with you, you too are not bound to observe it with them. Now, okay, we get the real Machiavelli out and out, but I turn this as originality or cognitive strength because the way in which he twists this to his, his own rationality, his own logic. And this excerpt really reminds me of Lincoln, as depicted in the movie Lincoln by Steven Spielberg, written by Tony Kushner, the playwright. But Lincoln was cunning and crafty like a fox as well, it seemed in politics, and could rise up and roar like a lion when he had to. And so I do think the first half of this excerpt is totally solid advice. But the second part, my conscience says to fight against what he's said. But when I look at it logically, I see that the arguments for both sides keep bouncing back and forth in my mind. Because if a good man is surrounded by bad men, he has to play their game in some sense, or else he is instantly obliterated. And Lincoln did not hold back from, you know, playing this game and buying votes and doing what other polit political things they did. Okay, next we have two moments of wisdom. The first is on page 185 and it is on the chapter called How Flatterers Should Be Avoided. Because there is no other way of guarding oneself from flatterers except letting men understand that to tell you the truth does not offend you, but when everyone may tell you the truth, respect for you abates. Therefore a wise prince ought to hold a third course by choosing the wise men in his state and giving to them only the liberty of speaking the truth to him and then only of those things of which he inquires and of none others. 
but he ought to question them upon everything and listen to their opinions and afterwards form his own conclusions. With these counsellors, separately and collectively, he ought to carry himself in such a way that each of them should know that the more freely he shall speak, the more he shall be preferred. Outside of these, he should listen to no one, pursue the thing resolved on, and be steadfast in his resolutions. He who does otherwise is either overthrown by flatterers, or is so often changed by varying opinions that he falls into contempt. Now, I love this excerpt. I think it's so readily applicable to everyone. In replacing in the text, instead of wise men in a state, the wise people around you just picking them out, presupposing that they care for you. This could be, I don't know, close friends, relatives, but endlessly inquiring and pushing the point and to make it known that the more freely uh, someone speaks to you, the more truthfully, the more they shall be preferred, the more that they shall be liked. I mean, nobody goes around conducting their business like this today or ever, I would think. And also observations like, when everyone may tell you the truth, respect for you abates. Anyone, again, in a position of power, I used to use that term, but we know it's true. Uh, last one, I'm whizzing through these because my camera's about to die. But the last moment of wisdom comes on page 191. For the actions of a new prince are more narrowly observed than those of an hereditary one. And when they are seen to be able, they gain more men and bind far tighter than ancient blood because men are attracted more by the present than by the past. And when they find the present good, they enjoy it and seek no further. They will also make the utmost defense for a prince if he fails them not in other things. Now, if you just substitute prince here for <laughs> manager, supervisor, any uh, leadership role, I think it also holds just as strongly. And instead of hereditary, one might say uh, nepotic or one got without uh, much effort. But I had the image in my mind when reading this of back when I used to work hospitality of a new manager coming in from another store instead of our store. Our store would be hereditary, you might say. And another store might be a completely new prince, a new manager. When they came in, they were more narrowly observed, but when they were seen to be able and much better than the previous ones, they were accepted much more readily than I think someone from our store raised up to that uh, position would be because we would have previous social ties with them that would change the dynamic between employer and employee. Anyway, there's that. Now the bow score. Even though I praise this book much, it seems to me its relation to me is a little bit removed and also what I'm looking for in books, this is not quite it yet. I mean, this is a man writing a certain manual for uh, a certain a small cloistered number of people, princes, leaders of state, who wrote a literary masterpiece, not wholly by volition, I guess. So, two out of five. Past worth memorizing, I don't think there's that much worth memorizing unless you have in your own life, life a leadership position. I don't think there's much worth memorizing for the average Joe. Now, our linear Aegon, this is the beginning of it, like a, a baby snake growing. Was it better than the myth of Sisyphus? Yes. All right, this has been fun. Uh, camera's about to die, so bye, uh, like, comment, subscribe, tell me this, that, and the other. Yo, check it out, see you later, boom.